Well, hello there, beautiful shrimp people. In today's video, we're going to do another Q and A. This is going to be Mark's shrimp pranks Q and A session uh, two. I was going to say one <laughs> before it had done the first one. Uh, guys, also, so you don't get bored, we are also going to include some bee footage because I have tons and tons and tons of it. Right, so my little buddy here will get trunk up away into the corner up here, and you'll be able to see shrimp. Right. So we are going to go through our questions today, and uh, yeah, let's get on with it. Alright guys, as well, I want to point out that I do have notes here because I can't possibly remember all your questions because I'm a bit thick. It would be kind of hard for me to remember 20 odd questions just off the bat anyway. So we're going to go through a little list that we have here. And there's a couple of pages. You guys were busy the other day when I asked the question. Do you guys have any questions for our Q&A session? You said, yes, Mark, we are going to give you Brazilians of them. Remember guys, you can ask me anything. It doesn't have to be shrimp related as long as it's not rude and like ultra personal and whatever else and I mean derogatory comments that's what I mean right so you can ask me anything bash away so let's begin all right shrimp farm cheese balls 3825 asks uh, how many waffles can you eat in one sitting right to be honest guys I actually love potato waffles I don't know if you're talking about the sweet waffles because I'm not that keen on them but if you're talking about potato waffles they're awfully waffly versatile and um, I could probably eat about I don't know, 12 of them, if I really had to dig in and with my fork and knife and munch away, I could probably eat about 12 of them in one go. Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually, guys, if you don't know, potatoes, any time, type of potato <laughs> is my absolute favourite food. It could be fries, french fries, it could be chips, it could be mashed potatoes, roasted potatoes, oh, roasted potatoes. I love potatoes, right? So, yeah, hopefully I've answered that question. Biatch Sloth says, <laughs> what a name, Biatch Sloth. Mark, could you please provide some tips on moving a fish room to a new home? Well, the best thing you could do with that, uh, Biatch Sloth, is to actually plan it out. Get yourself a clipboard like this, write stuff down, what you're going to do on what days, right? Because if you try and just gung-ho it and do it all at once, you'll just, um, you'll just upset yourself, basically. And so what you're better doing is, right, so for example, I'll just tell you what I did with my room. I have 20 plus tanks in here, 25 tanks, probably a little bit more than that now. And uh, when I was moving house, I had to be conscious that the shrimp needed to go somewhere while I was moving the tanks. So um, it was a little bit easier for me in that I was able to actually move my tanks with the shrimp in them. All I had to do was split them up into a manageable um, amounts during s certain days, right? So if you didn't know guys, I actually moved my tanks over the course of about three days, right? So it was basically how many tanks I could fit in to my car because I wasn't comfortable putting them in a trailer because you know what it's like in a trailer, you're driving along and you see the thing bashing up and going like this over every little pothole and speed bump and stuff. And yeah, it's not quite the same in a car. The suspension is a little bit better. So yeah, I did that and it took me about three days all i needed to do was add my water my reverse osmosis water that was aged and it had the proper remineralizer in it and we basically just filled the tanks up and everything was gung-ho gung-ho that's not the right word everything was hunky-dory right and um what i did notice from doing this guys is it was fine for my shrimp i don't i don't think i had even a sing one single shrimp death but it wasn't good for my fish right so i had other bristlemose pleco in this tank here and um, basically what happened with them guys is is I set up the tank, days go by, and I'm starting to notice that there's just not a certain bristlenose pellicle there, and then a week goes by, and then you, you're starting to wonder, are they even in the tank? So you start to rummage about in the tank and look around and whatever else, and, and they just disappeared. They're just gone. And so what I think's happened is when I've moved, I've lowered the water too much, and it's been too low for some of the fish, and as a consequence, this is something, that, it's a hard lesson to learn, guys. I won't move fish like that again. I'll, I'll actually put them into buckets with sufficient amount of water. It was a bit neglectful of me to think I could move fish like this size in this much water in a car over, I don't know, 50, 60 kilometers, something like that. And then put them in and I think it was just too much for this fish, right? So if you have fish, bag them up, put them in, in um, styrofoam boxes, something like that, because yeah, if you live in a colder country as well, you must use something to protect them. So hopefully that answers your uh, question, B. Sloth. That's quite a long one. My ear, oh my God. 
My ear is still quite bad today, guys. It's not as bad as yesterday, but I still have this weird noise that's there as well. I just, I can't explain it. It's just so annoying. And like in here, there's an echo, so it's even worse. Next question from the toxic mistress. She says, that my first, um, my first neoplant attack ever. Never had a fish as a kid or anything, so research as much as I can. Your videos are absolutely incredible. Thank you very much. And not to mention the fantastic Facebook group. Links are in the description, guys, if you want to go and check that out. What would you consider absolute essentials for a newbie shrimp keeper? Um, absolute essentials is, is to know how to cycle attack. How to set one up basically for the species of shrimp that you want to keep so that's something you re should research first i know it's not as simple as that guys most people go to a pet shop see see the animal get the animal then then they rush trying to like put something together to house them kind of thing but it's only when you get a little bit more experience that you look into cycling and setting up the tank beforehand and whatever else so think about the type of shrimp that you want to keep uh, how you're going to set up the tank, how you're going to prepare the water, and how you're going to actually acclimate the shrimp into the tank. And uh, you should be good from there. The little tips as well is make sure you age the water and use a good declonier. <coughs> I need more coffee. This is my first one of today. Mm. So thank you for that, uh, to Toxic Mistress. That was a good question. Uh, this next one is from... A spoiled sushi. These names today, oh my god, spoiled sushi. I can't think of anything worse than spoiled sushi, guys. I hate the thought of of rotten fish. I was never that into eating fish in the first place. But uh, rotten fish is like kind of turns my stomach a little bit. Let's get on with the question though. There's one of the, my world famous tangents. In your experience, can you explain the differences and changes as to shrimp tank setup? Six years ago versus now. Also, what is the best way to keep your proper buffering in your tank without using our water? I had a pure well water which was great and I can't quite grasp the buffering thing. All right, what's changed in the six years? Um, well, guys, I, I think this is going to be a really good, good answer here because the best way to answer this would be for me to say that there is no right way and no wrong way to set up a shrimp tank. I see professional shrimp keepers setting up shrimp tanks as an example like this. One will have a big section at the bar with, with this thick layer of um, active substrate in there and they'll have under gravel filtration. But in my own personal experience that does work but if, when I've tried to put an under gravel filter under normal substrate they clog up. Right, so it doesn't always work for each individual person. You've got to find something to put in between the substrate and the under gravel filter. Uh, one of the ones I've been doing recently is having a very, very minimal soil, but it seems to work well. It seems to work well for what I wanted to do, which is have a quick turnaround in the tanks if I need to, if the shrimp are not breeding. But guys, I've, like yesterday, for example, I was watching a German shrimp keeper, right? and this guy was actually using tap water. He had his tap water going through um, active carbon, a, a sediment filter, and the stuff was going straight into his tank and his active soil was like this thick really really thick active, active soil and it had bazillions of plants and he literally had thousands and thousands of shrimp in his tank and they were all over the place like this right but if I tried this it wouldn't work right? so it just depends on your, on your water source in the beginning and your capability to understand what you're actually doing with the the actual tank and its parameters and stuff in the, in the first place but because that's one thing I've always struggled to understand guys is is um, how to keep on top of your parameters right I've never looked for the key signals into like for example if a tank is failing what is what's causing it I know now of course but I didn't know that six years ago to the best of my knowledge right, so that is what kept me um, trying to fix tanks and trying to fix tanks and trying to fix tanks when the truth is, right, active soils in particular, they only last a certain amount of time. They're only good for a certain amount of time. They're only really good for a certain amount of time, right? Then they get averagely good, and then they're just plain useless as a soil. Right, so this is stuff that you have to figure out for yourself. Of course, there's channels like mine that help you out with this kind of question, and like, we'll answer it to the best of our abilities. I think you asked another question there. Let me see. You asked... Um, what is the best way to keep your proper buffering in your tank without using RO water? That's a very 
So I was going to say it's a difficult question. It's not a difficult question. It is, it's very dependent on your water source. You, I think you mentioned you had well water. You did. And so for that, guys, you need to measure your carbonate hardness in your well water, specifically your carbonate hardness, because it is what controls your pH in your water. All right, so if, like for example, if you have a lot of carbonate hardness, your pH is going to be higher because it's the stabilizer. But if you have no carbonate hardness, this is what um, basically means that you need something else to stabilize the water. So that is why in active substrate tanks, the, the soils are actually acidic, right? So you have an acidic buffer. And so for you specifically, spoiled sushi, I would look into seeing um, if your water has any carbonate in it. If it does, that could be a problem, and it, it will, will always inhibit your ability to lower your pH. So your steps from there would be to go with an RO unit. They're pretty cheap nowadays, they're like 40 bucks or something like that. Our water from this house would be, cons you would consider it to be kind of well water because our water is like a borehole that is right next to a river. So ours is well water, but it comes from a river, and I still use reverse osmosis because because you never know when something will happen. Just say some pipe bursts in this, this line up between my house and the river somewhere and there's loads of earth and dirt get, gets clogged into it. They actually have to flush it with chemicals to clean the pipe. Right? So you don't want any of that to go in your shrimp tank ever or you're going to have major problems. So I prefer not to have that risk. Uh, some waterways as well, you get trace amounts of copper and whatever else, lead, whatever. And yeah, you don't want that into your shrimp tank, right? So I've, I've just taken the, the, the opinion that it's best just to cut all of that out together and forget about all that risk and go with pure reverse osmosis water. Because then, guys, all you have to think about in the end is actually changing your membranes and your, your um, active carbon <coughs> and periodically changing your sediment filler because they can get quite dirty. That was a great question. Let me have another drink of coffee before I start coughing. <laughs> All right, Rehab Aquatics, you're on one side and then the, your question's on the other. All right, this is a good question. He says, Rehab Aquatics asks, in your opinion, what is the hardest vision calibration for beginners and why? Uh, the easiest one to keep is going to be your uh, crystal black shrimp because it is originally where all our bee shrimp came from. Right, so you have crystal reds and stuff. They were all like uh, a genetic mutation of the crystal uh, black shrimp and the crystal black shrimp you get you get them actually in the wild as well they're not as refined as in when, when you get them in the wild you would look at them and say oh those are culls those are not very nice crystal black shrimp but it's only through selective breeding that we've gotten the shrimp that we have in our rooms today most of these shrimp guys you don't get them in the wild apart from stuff like opa uli um, even red cherry shrimp I don't think you get red cherry shrimp in the wild you maybe do get the odd one but it's not like you don't get like like whole pools of just red cherry shrimp, if you know what I mean. So all of the all 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 of the shrimp that we have in our tanks are artificially created. Most of them are crystal reds artificially created. All Taiwan bees, uh, yeah, you get the gist. Right, so the easiest one for you to keep f for a beginner, without doubt, would be a crystal black shrimp. Guys, I even noticed some of my best breeding shrimp are my crystal black shrimp females in one of my tanks up there. They just keep on breeding more and more and more. And more. So that was a good question. Uh, Rehab Aquatics, thank you very much. Kippy Kiz. Kippy Kiz. My God. Your names, oh my God. What kind of aquarium moss do you like? I like Christmas moss at the lot. I actually love Christmas moss. It's one of my favourite mosses to look at. It's very, um, it's very nice to look at. I don't know how else I can say this. It's quite a beautiful looking moss in the way that it looks at the fawns going down like this into the the water, they all look like uh, a Christmas tree. Tiny little Christmas trees all joined together. I do like flame moss when I see it. Guys, there are a lot of mosses all look lovely, don't they? When, they? when they're done properly in tanks, even java moss can look look nice when it's in the right condition. So yeah, that was a good question. Thank you for that, Kippy Kids. Let's see, on to the next question, and, and it's from Nabokovfan87. Nabokovfan. Can you talk about your beer bomb tanks? Uh, can you... Can you talk about how your bare bomb tanks are cleaned? Do you ever siphon in the surface? Yes, I do. That's a very good question. It's a very good question. It's like my Opuli tank is bare bomb, but I will never clean the bottom of that because 
in that type of tank you don't ever do a water change so that it's not necessary to clean the base on this right but in some of my tanks like um, I have some of my um, Caradina tanks there is like a heap of gravel like this and it's all bare at the front this is what they do it for so, so they can actually siphon off uh, the front right guys and it's I don't think it's for the poop I don't think it's for the shrimp's poop I think it's more for um, waste food so it's waste food management so you know when you put your food in in the front it's basically it basically becomes your feeding area right and um, if the shrimp don't eat it it's very easy for you to set this to siphon it back up there's another reason as well I don't think I've ever spoken about this in my channel uh, and that is the reason that people have went to this way of doing it with, with the glass bare front and the, on the front instead of a thicker bed of substrate is because of a thing called hydrogen sulfur right it's a gas that comes off the rotten food that's in the layers I did videos on this years ago but I don't think I ever mentioned hydrogen sulfur um, the food basically goes off in the substrate layer guys right and it creates this gas and the gas is actually quite toxic to aquatic life so that is why a lot of professional shrimp breeders have decided to cut that part of it out altogether and go bare bottom and have a feeding space at the front that's just glass that you can cycle off of because then there's no waste at all. I might talk about that in a future video because that would make a good topic about why why old tanks start to fail and stuff. That's one of the main reasons hydrogen sulfide is pretty topic. So thank you for that question at Nabok Cove Fan 87. Thank you. On to the next one from Pink Spider uh, 4, I think that uh, IV, what is that, is that 4? God, it's in Roman numerals, I'm not sure. Pink Spider says, Hi, I recently bought some fire rate uh, cherry shrimp from a local aquarium that had their water at 14 GH, 0 KH and 400 TDS. Should I try more the GH and TH levels on the TDS or neither? Thank you. Well, for this tank, right, you would, uh, Pink Spider, you've got to consider what is in your tank because 14 GH is on the higher side for a uh, general hardness. 0 KH is on the lower side for neocaridina. So what I would do if I was you is I would uh, use your own water, right, measure what your parameters are in your own water first. Age your water first, obviously, and um, see what carbon hardness that you have on it. The GH matters, but it doesn't matter as much as carbon hardness as we talked about before. Carbon hardness is the pH fixer. You, of, of course you want general hardness in your tank, but you need to... Nearly all water will have a general hardness, apart from reverse osmosis water, but not all water has a KH carbon hardness, so you would want to see what your water specifically has as a carbon hardness value and go from there. So what I'm basically saying right, is take your tap water, right, put it into a bucket, let it age it for a day, take some measurements and see where you are with your old tap water. Right, if just say for example your readings are, I don't know, like 10 GH and, and 2 KH, your water is better suited for these neocaridina than the place that you got them from. Right, so test your stuff first. Alright, hopefully that answers your question. Because that, that KH of zero eventually could come to bite you in the ass eventually because it, 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 just say for example you have um, um, an, an inert substrate right and then you add this water to it. There's absolutely nothing in the tank to stop the pH swinging. So, so over time what's happening is you're putting food and stuff into the tank. You have all your botanicals, leaves and bits of wood and whatever else. All this stuff can add acidic content to it. Right, and it will start to drop your pH. Now, anytime you do a water change, you're going to take out that, that acidic content and then your pH will go back up again. Right? So this is called pH swinging. It's something that you want to avoid. Hello, I don't know why I'm waving like that. Hopefully it answers your question. Right? Figure out what your, your tap water is first and then work from there on in. Ask me, uh, once you've done this, you could probably uh, tell me somewhere via email or my Facebook group or something like that. And I'll tell you if it's suitable. It's quite easy to see if water is suitable or not. That was a good question. Thank you, Apic Spider. Adam says, Adam RW1UP says, Hello, Mark. Thanks for sharing your wealth of knowledge. How often should I add new shrimp to diversify the blood light in the mouth? Babe? Wait, I was told this, guys, by a professional shrimp breeder a long, long time ago that you're meant to, to 
uh, introduce new genetics into your shrimp tanks at least every six months but honestly guys I've, I've never done it I've never done it all I've done guys is I buy new shrimp when I can they go into my shrimp tanks and that is it so like for example I have a neocaridin tank up there you guys will have seen it all the neocaridina right, that are in it they're all red ones but they're all different types so you can see where I, over time I've been buying different types of shrimp so I've never went by that hard and fast rule of, of introducing new genetics every six months but um, I would suppose if you're like a professional breeder, it just depends on your level of shrimp keeping as well. If you're, if you're like a professional shrimp keeper, keeper, it's probably good to introduce new genetics every so often. But for me, I don't bother. I just do it when I buy new shrimp. Hopefully that answers your question, Adam. That was a good one. Let me see. Uh, Alberto Talk 3279 What's the best method to prevent combat the dreaded? Let me say that again for the trolling. After up. What's the best method to prevent and combat the dreaded bacterial infections that you can wipe out in tariff tanks? Uh, best method would be to keep on top of. Um, sorry, I've abashed the microphone there, it's on my chest. I would say the best method to keep your bacteria in control is probably to keep up with your water changes, make sure that you do them. Um, if you do start to see issues, start to think of why. Why would you start to see issues? Is the tank too cold? Because I, I know we'd bash on a bit like, like Neocaridina, for example, they can go quite low in temperature. But guys, the lower you go in temperature, the more I think it weakens the uh, shrimp's immune system to the point where they can, they can get like, they can literally get fungus grown on their body, white tufts of fungus and all this. It's the same with fish. Like for, so, if, if you have fish, for example, and, and your heater breaks, within a week you can, they can start to grow tufts of fluff and fungus and their eyes can go white and all this kind of thing. Like over, just over a couple of days, so if you have stuff like this in your tank, the best way to, to prevent it is to keep up with your water changes. Don't, do, um, don't overfeed, because that's a big one. Don't leave food in the water. Because if there's bacteria in the tank, they're all just going to feed on this food and multiply. Um, if you have to do this, you can use antibiotics. But it's not something I would recommend. I see a lot of uh, YouTubers like free treating fish with antibiotics. Every single time they get a new batch of fish, they're antibiotics, antibiotics. And, uh, yeah, that's not, just not the way I want to do it, guys. Because what happens with that is you start to get antibiotic resistance. Right, and let me give you an example. Just say I was getting a new batch of shrimp in here every single day, right, and I was bashing my antibiotics into the tanks. Right, eventually, the bacteria in the tanks would start to build a, a bacterial resistance. Right, even if I'm cleaning out the tanks 100%, boiling the tanks, bleaching them, get rid of all that bacteria, the bacteria is still in my water supply because I'm draining this water somewhere. Right, so that bacterial resistance is, is starting to grow. Right, so you can see where I'm going with this. You don't want to use um, antibiotics too much for this kind of thing. I mean, there's a reason why doctors don't prescribe it all the time either, because there's only a certain amount of anti antibiotics that work, and if you keep on using them, then the, build, the, the resistance builds up, and they start to become less effective. Right? So, yeah, make sure your water's clean, and don't overfeed, and that'll help you a ton. That is a good question. Thank you for that, belt or talk. Next question, at MRG7721, hello MRG, or Ivan, is that your name I thought I saw in the comments the other day, Ivan? So the question is, any gym goals, some flies, various color you've seen? Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I was thinking about this the other day, let me have a little sip, sip of coffee as well, because it's quite hard to talk for this long, and have a dry throat. Um, any dreams and goals? I was thinking about my goals yesterday, actually, just happened to be thinking about it yesterday. And I think it's because I was looking at some of my older videos and I was wondering what I wanted to do with my tanks. And guys, the, the thing that I liked the most in my shrimp room was Taiwan bees. Taiwan bees, blue boats, wine reds, king kongs. You get the gist. And that has kind of slowly been going out of my shrimp room. So I think that is something that I'm going to start to get back into again. It's your basic Taiwan bees. Have a a wine red tank, have a, a blue bolt tank, have a king kong tank, panda tank, blue bolt tank and uh, yeah that's where I want to go with my shrimp. I love Taiwan bees, they just, I think it's because the colours are so different 
red, black, blue, whatever else. Uh, rarest colour I've ever seen. Rare, rarest colour. I don't know about rare. It's not really rare, but the, the, the ones I like the most are the, the shrimp that have the shadow blue. And it's not very rare at all. And it's very evident in, in tanks where they have the blue genetic and the water is super crystal clean. Super crystal. I don't mean clear, I mean clean. You tend to get shrimp that are very, 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 very blue and it looks so cool. It almost looks unnatural, guys, a blue shrimp in a, in a green tank of plants and whatever else. I think that's what makes them look so cool, blue. Not very rare, but the coolest. Hope that answers your question, MRG or Ivan, if that is your name. Let me know as well in the comment if that was you or not. It says also, oh, there was a second question he asked. It says, Also, what brand of coffee do you drink? I think it's uh, Nescafe Espresso, I like. But I drink, it's called Espresso, but I like to drink it in the big cups. Imagine going into a bar like I did in an airport once and I asked for a coffee and the woman came back over a little shot glass like this with a tiny little amount of brown liquid in it and I, and I literally said to her, what the F is that? I was like, Get, see whatever that is, times 10 in a big cup, please. This cafe espresso, I like Americano as well. It just tends to be any nest coffee actually. I know it's instant coffee, but I never I've never really liked the other stuff. We have coffees with the coffee filters and coffee machines and I just like I just like the simple instant stuff quick to make, you know. JD Tanks. Hello JD, welcome to my channel. Uh, he says continue on the water change question in the Facebook group. A lot of people say we don't do water changes. Some say 20 to 50 percent weekly rather than every few weeks. What are your thoughts on this? And do you do it different with one nails and how do you look all right? All right, let's answer your first part first, and that is, do you do it differently? If our nails, I do, I do, I do. Opu Uli never. They never ever get a water change. I top the tank up with pure reverse osmosis water, which which um, would simulate rainwater, I suppose. I'm saying I never do. I think with this bottom tank down here, I think I did a water change in it. Like after its second year, just to freshen it up a little bit. But in general, yeah, you never have to do a water change in an Opa Uli tank. They, these guys are, um, they have evolved to live in extremely harsh conditions, like way harsher than you think, guys, that tank would possibly be. Think of a rock pool on a sunny day, right, that is, for example, a rock pool that is way up on the high tide mark and there's never any water change, it just fills with rainwater now, now and again. Super mega hot around the edges. That's what these guys have um, been evolved into. Uh, God, I've lost for words. They have evolved to live like that. Oh my God, Mark Jesus. And what was the other part you said? Oh, we're talking about neos. My neos are... Uh, I can do up to 50% water change in my neo tank a week. There's not a problem with them because your, your, uh, your soil tends to be inert. For my Cardina tanks, guys, I tend to do, take it a little bit easier. But I, I don't see the point in doing smaller water changes with Neo Cardina tanks. So, for example, instead of me doing 25% water change in, in a tank every week, which I think is just a waste of time, because the, the whole goal in a, in a Cardina tank is to uh, grow, as, grow plants and or grow algae. Right? So you, you've got one or the other. Right, and you also want to have nutrient export, guys. I don't think I've ever talked about this in a video either. So you have um, algae and you have plants. Right, so to get nutrient export, more nutrient export, what you want is more light. That's probably what you guys will probably realise why I'm going a bit overboard with light because the more light that you can put above a tank without going crazy, so it's not like direct sun in their face kind of thing. Right, the higher your nutrient export will be. So if my tank here, for example, has a higher nutrient export because all the um, all the stuff on the sides is green, then that means I don't have to do as many water changes. Right? It's not the same for a neocardina tank because uh, the, there's not a, as much of a build-up of stuff. Right? Because in, in, in our cardina tanks, you have our active substrate and it has, basically has fertilizer in it. It has ammonia in it and all that kind of stuff, so you have to export it somehow out of the tank. But you have to do it in a way, guys, that you're not doing massively overly big water changes. And so what I've been doing, guys, is this. I've, I've been 
leaving my tanks for sometimes up to like a month at a time. And then I'll do one big water change. Could be 50%, could be 60%, and that is it. That is it. So yeah, someone said to me in the earlier questions like, has anything changed in the way I do things? My shrimp tanks from six years ago to now. Yeah, this is one of the things, my Caradina tanks. I'm not that specific on uh, doing water changes on time every single week, 25, 30%. I just don't see the point in doing that. I would rather let the tank itself export the nutrients and you do one bigger water change a month because I think it stresses the shrimp less as well. That's where I do it. So I went quite into detail there, haven't I? Well, hopefully I've got the right actual question. Let me see. Uh, I'm just going to read your question again, just in case I missed any key points there, because I am bad for that. Continuing our water change question in the Facebook group, a lot of people say they don't do water change. Say, some say 20 to 50% every two weeks. What are your thoughts? Right? So that was it. That was me. I've answered your question. Thank you for that, JD Tanks. Uh, let's get on to the next one. God, my ear is ringing. It's ringing. Guys, you know what else is it's weird, right? I, I've never said this to anyone ever, right? but over the last few years, I don't know if it's an age thing as well, but when I'm walking, it actually sounds like the wind is whistling in my ear. Must be an age thing. Must be. All right, next question is from Shrimp Pedo. Shrimp Pedo, maybe? Shrimp Pedo? Shrimp Edo. Maybe Shrimp Edo. Let's not judge. Maybe I've said it wrong. He, he says... Hey Mark, do you only use sponge fillers? I do, guys, I do. Let me tell you why as well, because it's not the same for everybody. I use sponge filters simply because it is more practical for me to use them in a shrimp room like this. It means I don't have any, um, I don't have an excess of uh, plugs, even though you can see I have, t have tons of plugs here for the lights. But these are all actually plugged into one main plug switch over there, right? So that's why I do it. I, I don't like to have uh, too many plugs in the room. They also use up um, less electricity, sponge filters. Uh, so yeah, that is why I do it with them. I only use them because, guys, it is the shrimp tanks are actually better with just sponge filters as well, I think, uh, because the shrimp love to graze on them. All the other stuff, we've talked about this a billion times. Yeah, so I only use sponge filters because it is best suited to me in a larger aquarium environment. It's just cheaper, less cables, less plugs, whatever else. Good question, Shrimpedo. Uh, next question is from Glendon uh, Harmon. Glendon Harmon. Glendon, Glendon uh, Harmon. Got your guys' names today. From, ten, from a 10 year current if your males' eggs start to hatch, how long does it take for the whole book to finish hatching a full size adult? Or probably less than a couple of days. Let me just say that again because sometimes I'm not the best at speaking. From the time a neocaridina female's eggs start to hatch, how long does it take for the whole brood to finish hatching? A full size from a full size. I'm not, it wasn't me, was it? It wasn't my English. Oh my God, Glendon. Um, probably just a couple of days. I would imagine it takes for the first shrimp to be born out of its little egg, and then for the last one to be born, a couple of days. Uh, probably is is a good idea that this happens as soon as possible, so the female can molt and then. She starts to get bred with again and whatever else. Good question, Glendon. A, a harmon, har, harmonon, monon. All right, next question. Uh, Jiki1356. Hello there, Jiki. Why, so what's the time is out of control in a tent? So can it? Yeah, just grab your pair of scissors and get in there. That's all you need to do. Don't worry about overly cutting it because it's it's not like other plants. So what's her tongue? Just get right in there. It's not like it's not like a terrestrial plant where you cut it back too much and it dies. It's, there's no what's the water tongue? There's like no root and there's no branches and there's no leaves and it's all one. So you don't have to worry about that. Just get in there and start cutting away. Uh, let's go to the next question that is from uh, uh, Talk Three. Talk Three says: Is the shrimp's breeding behaviour an indicator of water quality? I overplanted, added house plants as well, never treated water, testing for ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, and pH all seem good, and shrimp are active and breeding like rabbits. So his question is Is the shrimp breeding behavior an indicator of water quality? Yes, they're interlinked completely. If you have good water quality, your shrimp will breed much more. So I don't know how else to answer that, but 
It is that simple. If you had, if you have bad water, if your tank is just a mess, your shrimp will breed less. So good quality is a good thing. Good question, talk. On to the next question. It's from T M B Rack. Team Brock, maybe. What's your feelings on how the Martin filter and Martin filters in general's pros and cons, please? I think you'll listen to Brock using them. Thanks. Uh, pros and cons. Pros would be uh, the massive size of uh, area for bacteria to colonize in the tank. Um, the other pro would be the massive area again for your shrimplets and stuff to actually go on and graze. Um, there's probably more pros than that. Oh, well, the other ones would be, you can actually put stuff behind them, filter media, ceramic rings, whatever else behind. So, so you have a lot of filtration in the tank. Did, it, did I just spell it to my own hand? Did you see that? You have a lot of filtration in the tank. Um, but cons, right? So this is, this is the game changer for me and why I don't use them. And that is because you can never clean them. To me, that is a problem. Sponge filters in a tank, you need to be able to clean because they do get clogged up. Right, so on my little sponge filters here, occasionally, maybe like every six months or something like that, right, you will see that the water doesn't flow at the end, but it's still bubbling away full speed. Right, so that indicates that the, the flow isn't coming up the tube and coming out the, the actual filter itself. So they do actually need to be cleaned, sponge filters. Now, I'm not sure how often you'd have to clean a Hamburg Matten filter, but that's an awful lot of waste to have in a shrimp tank, I think, if you can't clean it. Right, so there, there's just basically a wall of, I don't know, ammonia and nitrate, nitrate in your tank. That's why I don't use them, guys, because it, they, 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 I did have them before. I've, I've had a few of my tanks set up with a Hamburg Martin filter. And, yeah, they're just impossible to clean. If you have tons and tons of tiny baby shrimp that are one mil, born at one mil, how, how do you deal with the Hamburg Matten filter when you have shrimp that size in a tank? I, I couldn't, so that's why I don't use them. I like the simple little double sponge filter. If, if you need more filtration, just add, add another double sponge filter in them. But there's probably millions of people that can actually get Hamburg Matten filters to work properly for them, but for me, no. I just... It's not that I don't like them, just they're just not practical, I don't think. I don't think. That was a good question. Thank you for that, TM Barack. Brian Haig, 4978. Your question is on the next page. Let me see. Brian. Brian says, I instead of a new tank for the second mini, of course, it's the best I've seen before or after the fish. Um, I would always add the shrimp first to a tank, right, and add them in a small number. So you've, you've just set up a tank, your, fil your filter media is matured, your filters are, is, your tank is just ready to go, and you're wondering wh how to add your, your animals, your inhabitants. I would start with a couple of uh, shrimp first, and just see how they get on. You should never really add tons and tons of shrimp to a tank that is, uh, hasn't been set up very long, because it can crash, right? Because your, your inhabitants could um, crash the system. Yeah, I don't know how else to word it. It's, uh, yes, it's one of those mornings. My ear is exploding. The hubbing, it, like God. Hopefully that answers, answers your question. Yeah, just add your, your shrimp first in small numbers. Add a little bit more later on. Once you're sure that they're actually okay, you can add more and then you can add your little fish as well. Just keep in mind that all fish do eat shrimp, all of them. The only ones I've never been sure of is bristlenose plecos. That's why I have them in this tank. I know anglers probably do as well. But there you go. User VYXYYZHB2D asks, what kind of name is that? How do you actually clean, clean your substrate from waste down that side? We touched on this a little bit before, right? So in a tank where you have a layer of active soil, I never clean it ever. Because guys, you have to bear in mind, this is the action of the shrimp when they're feeding. Look, right, if they don't like something, it gets flung away up like this. Right, so quite often when I'm uh, cleaning a sponge filter, you see how all our stu stuff's interlinked, we're just talking about sponge filters. Um, when I'm cleaning a sponge filter, like, like for example, Akadama, if I go over there right now to one of my Akadama tanks and I take out the filter and I put it in a bucket of water and I start to squeeze the, the sponge filter, guys, the, the colour of the water that come out of it will be the same colour as the Akadama. 
Right, so what's happening is a little shrimp in the tank like this, firing up all the little bits and pieces. You, you, if you look very close with a little macro camera or something, you can actually see it happening. They will literally go, literally go like this, guys, with they go like this. Look, don't like that bit, don't like that bit. And they're flinging it away into the water column, and all these little bits get taken away and dragged into the sponge filter. So, uh, you never have to clean your uh, soils. But at the same time, remember we were talking about this buildup of hydrogen sulfate. It can be an issue if you're feeding your shrimp in one spot all the time. This is why I always recommend that you use a feeding dish if you have a thicker soil. Uh, and that is why most professional breeders nowadays are going away from the thicker soils and they're going to a bare bottom tank at the front so they can actually hoover up all the junk that's left over from the food. That's a good question. Thank you for that user. V Y X Y seven H B two D. All right. Is the best question been left at last? Let me have a little coffee before. Oh my God! We've been talking forty minutes. That my coffee is cold. Right on to the last question, and it comes from a guy called Blue Nose three two two five. And his question is: How is the best team in Scotland? Best team? Does it mean football team? Well. If you mean football team, it's probably the one that's in top of the league, and that would be this club here. Hopefully that answers your question. That was the best question of the whole video. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Alright, Shim from that is your Q&A for the week. Right? That is this one already done and dusted. If you'd like to subscribe and like, then please do that. If you'd like to become a member and help the channel, like, please do. I've got tons of shrimp to feed, and I've got a little doggo there to feed, and I have to feed myself as well. Oh my god. You can also buy... Um, you can also buy a t-shirt or a hoodie if you like and uh, become a channel member. That is, uh, I bet you've already even said that. Now, that's what I'm saying, my memory is to put at this age. Guys, I had to Google my age for the last four years to find out I was 47 every year. I'm still 47 apparently, I don't know, I don't know how this works. Anyway, hey guys, <laughs> hope you enjoyed today's show and I'll see you all in the next one. Happy shrimp keeping.